I'm retired Battalion Chief Larry Cockman, Chairman of the Greensboro Fire Department History Group Committee. The American Fire Service is rich in tradition and culture. A firefighter's life is filled with many emotional highs and lows, stories of major fires, national disasters, medical calls, firehouse living, and family life are often verbally shared from one generation to another. Many times these stories are lost forever when a firefighter passes away. In an effort to preserve these stories, in 2019, the Greensboro Fire Department History Book Committee launched a new program of recording audio video of our retirees' lives. These stories will be shared on our website, gfhbc.org. In 2020, we did not record because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Please listen as these firefighters share their life experiences with all of us. My name's Harold Ray Robbins. I'm 70 years old. I've joined the fire department on June 1st, 1973. Retired in 2008 and was a battalion chief in the fire department. I have a son in the fire department now that was uh, been here 18 years now. He's at Station 20. His name? Uh, Jeremy Scott Robbins. You know, before I joined the fire department, I was working with my dad in the, his business's cabinet shop and uh, doing cabinet work and whatever else came along. Married. What? There was nothing that made me want to join the fire department. Uh, neighbor, Jay McCarter, was on the fire department, and he talked to my cousin about joining the fire department, and then I thought, well, that'd be a good place for me to be, and I could still work with my dad and help him out. The process <laughs> for getting hired was come out, do a uh, jumping jack setups and pull-ups, and then they'd take a jog out to the building, and you'd have to let yourself out of the window and pull yourself back in, which you'd have a rope around your waist so they wouldn't totally lose you. But uh, that was basically the process in the interview at that time also. My training class was only six weeks. I was uh, hired uh, June 1st, and me and four others were hired before July 1, and they couldn't hire the rest of the class until after July 1. So I was out here for six weeks. My first day was going around the uh, asphalt out here with a trenching pick, trimming grass. That was before string trimmers. <laughs> and then I was put on the truck for six weeks, and then we came back out to go through training for six weeks. Some of the people in my training class were Phil May, Brooks Langley, Pete Culberth, uh, Raymond Holloman, uh, Bob McLean. There were 14 of us originally. Mike Henson. The funniest thing in training. <laughs> uh, Brooks Langley. Couldn't stand to be tied down. And we put him in a Stokes basket and brought him out of the building, and by the time we got him to the ground, he was out of the Stokes basket because he couldn't stand to be tied into it. <laughs> a funny thing happened at the station. I was at Station 5. I was riding a truck company. Richard Page was on the engine company. They had gone on a call, and I decided I'd take a shower while they were gone. So I got in the shower, and I heard somebody say, Can I use your toilet? And I just kept trying to say, them guys are messing with me. So then, can I use your toilet? I just kept showering. And so uh, then I heard the toilet flush. And I said, I just kept showering. And then the door started rattling. This lady opened the door. And she had a drink of Dr. Pepper in her hand. And she said, Hi. I looked at her, I said, what are you doing in here? So I just reached over and shut the door. It rattles again. She said, hi. 
I said, you're not supposed to be in here. Now I shut the door back. She she left, I guess. I didn't see any more of them. But uh, she couldn't believe what she saw when she first looked in there. I, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> My feelings when we got into training were, uh, first of all, was to do a good job. And then making friendships with the people that were in there, uh, I can say we had some good people in my training class, and uh, well, with Pete Colbert in there and Raymond Holloman, you had something going on all the time, anyway. So uh, it was a good camaraderie between us all. I felt like. Well, it was a uh, change from what I had always done, everything, because I'd really never. Never had another job except working at a service station and working for my dad, working with him. My first station, apparatus, I was stationed at Central Station downtown on Truck 2 at uh, Robert Atkins, J.C. Barham, and Charlie Bean was our captain. It was, uh, well, that was a good experience period for me. They were all worked with me and told me a lot. My first captain, Charlie Bean, was a uh, good man and we picked on him a lot and a few things and he was a man of good morals. He uh, talked a lot of things and gave me some uh, instruction, got me driving the truck. Well, we was on the truck one morning. It was cold, and I never wore a coat. And he said, you drive back to the station. So we were over on one of the uh, narrow streets off of Bessemer Avenue, and Charlie was riding around there, and he was bouncing. He looked over at me. He said, you can get up on the street anytime you want to. <laughs> <laughs> I probably had some nicknames that I didn't hear or Know about, but there were some that uh, one that stuck with me for a while there toward the end. <laughs> you want to share it with us or do it not? I was, you were witnessing <laughs> of the, being called the department asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it stuck. I mean, I even, uh, we had a conference here in Greensboro, and I come in after the conference, and there was a name tag on my desk. It says Department of Asshole. <laughs> the union during my career was active uh, but not like it is today. They would put signs up in the station, posters at, about a meeting or something and some chiefs would come in and tear them down. And, uh, I worked for some good chiefs. Okay. And good captain. During my career, our uh, companies cooked together, or when I was out at like Station 8 and stations like it, we cooked as individuals. Uh, Central Station, the four companies up there, we cooked as companies. Mm -hmm. And our company, at one time, the only thing we had to do was tell the captain. Captain Spainer, how good he was doing, and we didn't have to do a whole lot of cooking. He did it all. Mm -hmm. And one day, the, I cooked up there, and uh, we had a captain that worked up there at the time that there was a certain day of the week they had to take the stove down and clean it. So I was cooking, but I didn't have a stove. So when I went to the store, I brought everybody back a pack of Beanie Weenies, a pack of crackers, and a can of uh, Viney sausage. That didn't go over too well. But I didn't, I didn't go over. I think it is for the companies to cook and eat together. It's a uh, part of the, uh, I guess you say friendship, or being a team, and uh, the times that you sit there at the table and things you talk about that don't necessarily concern the fire department. 
and you learn a lot about each other's families and issues that they may have and you thought that you had bad issues but they had some issues too that same as you did because a lot of our kids were the same age and everything like that and you learn more I didn't have a favorite dish. Uh, it got to where I would fix a chef salad at Station 5 when I was over there, and that got to be a uh, thing that some of them look forward to. Well, Jerry Schamberg said it made him stronger, <laughs> that he could work out better. <laughs> the, I, I feel that the sleeping quarters in the stations now are part of a necessity of the way they are arranged and everything because of the difference in the personnel. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily men versus men, but men and women. Uh, I worked with the first women hired at the fire department at Station 8. They took the captain out of his room, put him in with the battalion chief, and let the women have the captain's room which Chuck Morris and I took care of that one night. So We went in and we called a... Back then, radio stations didn't stay on 24 hours. We called around till we found a radio station that stayed on 24 hours. We tuned the radio to it, took the back off of the dresser in the bedroom, put the radio inside the dresser in the bottom drawer, and set it for 2 o'clock in the morning. Well... It went off the next morning. The battalion chief coming there, he said, I don't think she'd ever find that damn thing. <laughs> Jack Hope. Yeah. I think the families coming to the fire station is good for the men that are working as well as everybody on the shift. That way it gets you to know their families and uh, how... There are sometimes, you know, some of them's got a bunch of children, <laughs> and you, uh, you know, you don't realize it until they bring them all in. But uh, we had some that come in, you know, and it's it's good. The first, I don't remember which was the first call. Uh, it was probably to the mill, cone mill. First fire was driver place three fatalities. I hadn't been through training. Uh, Charlie was my captain. Chief Hare was the chief on the scene. Well, Charlie told me to stay out and help Robert with lights and things like that. Chief Hare saw me out there. He said, you get on the air pack and get in the building house. I said, okay. So I put on the air pack and I'm crawling down the hall and I run into Charlie. Charlie said, what are you doing in here? I said, Chief said, you get back out of here. And the last time I saw him and Chief were having a conference on the front of the porch of the house. But there were three fatalities there that morning. Uh, two men and a woman. I thought about it. And I thought, am I supposed to be doing this? But then I said, somebody's got to do it. And, uh, well, it got to where truck two, uh, everybody called us uh, more or less like the death wagon. It seemed like every time we went out, we had a fatality. And, uh, but it's, yeah. it's a gift to you. Medical calls when I first came on the department, and I was stationed at Central Station, uh, the real Central Station, uh, was a rescue squad. as a panel truck with two people riding it and very little equipment. And uh, I rode it several times when I was at uh, Central. And, uh, but then, you know, we changed where we were responding more with the EMS and everything and most of that came about after I was promoted to captain and battalion chief. 
and uh, the weren't as uh, what's say prevalent as they are today. The response, medical call response times, I feel are good because of the uh, uh, location of the fire stations and getting the uh, assistance for someone there as quick as we can. I mean, it's the same thing with fire calls. That's the reason we've got our stations located where they are because according to the uh, numbers, it shows that that's the uh, best place and most effective for the people. Of, and that's what we're supposed to be looking after as people. On 9-11 that morning, I was sitting in my office finishing up my paperwork and uh, roster and watching the news. And uh, I didn't see the first structure that was hit but then I was watching it when the second one was hit. The whole thing of 9-11 will make you, with the nature of our job, will make you think about the area you're in, what could happen next, and then when you walk out and look up in the sky, and you don't see a plane in the sky for two or three days. And it, it puts this feeling over you of, you know, what can we see next? And there's always that possibility, even as citizens and firefighters especially. Yeah, the some... mentors that I what you might say, grew up with in the fire department, where I had some good captains at uh, Charlie Bean, Ronnie Osborne, uh, and well, A.B. Kimmel, Raymond Cockman, mm -hmm. and uh, I had a varied, uh, I guess you say personality or the way that they operated. Dan Banks, I had Dan Banks, and I tried to pick from each one that I saw as a good trait and what I felt would work good for me as far as what I could do for my people. Challenges in the fire department change daily and uh, you have to be able to adjust to the challenge and uh, sometimes they're good. There are also uh, bad challenges, and the thing of it is, just no, it's different because of the nature of the job, but it's no different than any job that you might get in. Because any job that you go into, you've you've got challenges every day, and it's going to change, and you're going to have your highs. I had my highs. I've had my lows. And you have to realize you've got a job to do. And if you're in your lows, you've got to work through those lows and go on and get back on the highs. I guess the proudest time was when I was promoted to battalion chief. Because when I came on, that was more or less my goal, to get to be battalion chief. And uh, uh, it was a time where you were able to help people in their careers and also they're the ones that make you look good. Because uh, like when I retired and they had the, uh, luncheon for me and everything and I told the guys, I said, you know, y'all are the ones that make me look good. You were out there fighting the fire, working in emergency situation, whatever, and I was just there to help and direct you to do what I saw need to be done. So the, the men are the ones that uh, make us look good. I was uh, 
So worked with the first female firefighters, uh, uh, D.N. Staley, where she was D.N. Clapp at the time, and Melanie Trado, and uh, several, I worked with Kate Pierman, and uh, like I say, I was one of the first. My career, I would do it in a heartbeat. The uh, People, having the people and working with the people and having people that enjoyed their job and were willing to do a good job always made me feel good. And uh, I had some good people that uh, were always willing to do whatever they needed to get the job done. And sometimes people going over and above and uh, I had people that uh, you could depend on. I had a fire one night, and uh, I had a captain took his crew in. It's a residential house fire. He come out. He said, "Chief, it's too hot. So we can't do it." And I knew when this captain said it was too hot, it was hot. I had another one come to me at the time. And he said, I can cool it down. I knew what he was going to do, but we hadn't taken on that process yet as far as uh, positive pressure ventilation. And he had been to some training on it. And I, depend, I, I had faith in him. I told him I said, do it. He did it. The other captain took his crew in and put the fire out. And uh, that's another thing about Knowing your job, but knowing your people and what they can do and what you can expect out of them. I can't think of a thing that I could do different. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there were times that uh, people didn't like my decisions and some things I made, but it's like every time that I got a new captain into my battalion, he'd call me and say, I'm going to come over and talk to you and uh, you tell me what you expect. Okay. I go over and talk to him. He said, now, what do you expect of me? I said, do your job. I said, you do your job. You won't have any problems out of me. You're responsible for this company. You make the decisions for this company. If you can't handle it or something you're not sure, you call me. I said, don't think about it. You might not like the answer. If I had to make the decision, <laughs> if, if it wasn't for my wife and her support, <laughs> and her having to do what she had to do uh, when I wasn't there. While I was at school, or if I was out doing something, if it wasn't for her <laughs> and her support, I couldn't. Uh, and uh, I could say the last two years, or th almost three now, uh, she. As you know, she's sort of had to look after me yeah. as far as health. I mean, I um, had COVID. I had, two years ago had quadruple bypass surgery. And that puts a lot of stress on her. Yep. On her. And the kids, and then my daughter had uh, breast cancer the same time I had uh, the quadruple bypass. And uh, my wife is one that she will 
takes other people's problems like they're her own. I've been married 50 years. <laughs> oh, uh, the fire departments, yeah, fire department. memory of me. What would you like to leave? The people, what I'd like to leave behind is that he was hard, but he cared about everyone, and he treated everyone the same with no favors, nothing that uh, you was out of the normal routine thing. I know you have to, somebody does a good job and is willing to work, and do their job like it ought to be, you have to show them some, if they come to you and got something that they need to do or want to do or if they're wanting to change something, some way of doing something at the fire department, you have to tell them, say, yeah, we'll look at it and give you that option. But uh, the main thing, it's like I said before about the captains when they'd come to talk to me, it, if you have to come to me, you may not like the answer. The biggest advice that I would give to young firefighters in training and even young firefighters on the line is the same thing that I told J.W. Manus when he and I were going to school from the station and uh, working toward our degrees. And I, I hadn't been on long. And I told him, I said, you know, I've learned one thing. You do your job and keep your nose clean, you'll do fine. And that's uh, the way I feel about a young person coming in because there are, I'm not saying that every firefighter is a uh, model person, but if their younger people aren't careful, they will wind up following someone that's not that exactly that model person and it could ruin their career. Anybody can be influenced by the people they are around. And there again, like I say, there's all firefighters are not model people. And you have some captains that you'd love to have a young man working for him. You've got some battalion chiefs You'd like to have these young people in their battalion. And uh, I sort of feel like that was uh, the way some people felt about me just by some of the people that were put in my battalion that had worked with me and seen me through the years. And some of them, some of them didn't think that much uh, as far as me and the way I did things and I mean I can I can be an asshole <laughs> but uh, they didn't think that much about me and the way I was until they had the opportunity to work with me alongside me and they saw a change and one of them even said one day, said, when we have a meeting, Harold don't say a whole lot. But says, if he says something, you better listen. I like for my family to mean me as being fair, sometimes hard, disciplined, and working with them and doing the best that I could for them. As far as leaving a special message to someone, you're leaving yourself wide open. Uh, <laughs> no, I, uh, if I was to leave a special message to anyone, I guess it would be my wife. Sandy, 
Like I say, we've been married 50 years. And I've told people time and time again, if anything ever happened to her, you wouldn't have to worry about me looking for another one because I couldn't find one. <laughs> As good as she is. And uh, like I say, the... Uh, uh, 2019, I had that quadruple bypass. It wasn't nothing. And then I had this COVID. And my doctor called me uh, two days after I got out of the hospital for me to come for him to check me out. He walked in the room. He said, man, it's good to see you. I said, it's not half as good for you to see me as it is for me to see you. I said, quadruple bypass? Wasn't nothing. But I said, this crap will kill you. But Sandy, Sandy's been a trooper. Well, that's like uh, I talked a while ago about the uh, different battalion chiefs, district chiefs, and stuff like that. I worked with Chief Price. First time I saw that man, I said, gosh, I hope I never have to work for him. I go in I go in uh, Station 1 one day, or Central, and my captain comes up to me and said, you're driving the chief today. I said, oh, is that right? And so I said, okay. So I saw Chief Price a little later, and I said, uh, they tell you I was driving you today? He said, no. I told them you were driving me today. I said, okay. <laughs> and you would have to know this man to appreciate this because he was big, gruff talking. He'd come in there and he would chew us out. And before he walked out, there'd be a tear going down his cheek. And then, uh, and sometimes he would think of something else he needed to say and he'd come right back in. And one day he called another firefighter up there mocking him. <laughs> so every time after that, he'd ask that particular firefighter, said, is there anything you need to say today? <laughs> Good people. I mean, I've worked with uh, Chief Honeycutt, Chief Sprinkle, Chief Marsh, all the old people. Yeah, good, good. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, don't know, I had, like I say, a bunch of good captains. So. People that other people seem to, uh, well, Ray Richard. A lot of people didn't like Ray Richard, but he I feel like he was part of the reason I was at eight driving. But I had a captain, Richard Johnson, had got promoted to captain when I moved, got moved to Engine 2. And uh, I was supposed to go with Truck 2 out to 10. Well, the captain on Engine 2 at the time needed another driver, and they looked at the list, and he said, I'll take her. And uh, then he got promoted to battalion chief, and Richard was my captain. And I was down there one night, and Richard said, if you want a driving job, now's a good time to put in for it. And I thought, here I am. I didn't have three years on. I said, then I'll go make me driver. That was back before you had to take a test to get driver. So I thought, I'll write a letter. I wrote a letter. I'll end up getting a driving job <laughs> at Station 8. And I had, I'd been on, like say, about two and a half years. And uh, for Richard, Richard, uh, and I always got along good. I feel like Richard thought a lot of me. Well, yeah. the day that I got promoted to battalion chief, he called the house. And Sandy answered the phone. I wasn't there. I was working a trade, really. And he said, well, I was just calling to congratulate her on his promotion and it wasn't even supposed to be out and because Chief Jones called me at the station and uh, said I want you to come up to my office in the morning he said I'm going to promote you he said but don't you say anything about it wasn't an hour later they come out with a bulletin on it <laughs> and so, uh, I worked around a lot of people and a lot of good people and a lot of people asked me if me getting the uh, associate's degree in fire protection, if that helped me. I said the biggest thing that helped me was being around the right people 
at the right time, at the right place. <coughs> and uh, at that time, that was a lot of it. In closing, the Greensboro Firefighters History Book Committee hopes you have gained a greater insight into the dangers, the challenges, and emotional events that have influenced and shaped the American firefighter. Thank you.